Shall we turn our Bibles once again to Genesis? <clears throat> we will continue with our consideration of raising a godly family from Genesis chapter 18 and relevant passages in its context. Now, the next thing that we want to take note is the fact that where Lot failed miserably, Abraham succeeded, especially in the case of Isaac. Now, I said especially in the case of Isaac because we, did, we do know that Abraham made a mistake in that he took his maid, Egyptian maid Hagar and had a son called Ishmael. That was not a very successful story. Nonetheless, uh, we have from God's own mouth great words of commendation for Abraham as to how he brought up Isaac. And so we are going to pay attention to that. Abraham had made had made mistakes, uh, but he repented as soon as God corrected him. Now, none of us are going to be perfect fathers or husbands or mothers and wives, but that doesn't mean you know you can keep on making mistakes. When we are made aware of our imperfections and disobedience, we must quickly repent and change our ways. If you linger in your sins or your misdeeds, saying that all make mistake, none is perfect, then you are giving excuse for your miserable behavior. And that will only lead you to greater misery in time to come. And the record of the scripture concerning Abraham's nurture of his family, Sarah and the promised son Isaac, has some valuable lessons for us to learn. So let's pick them up. Now I'm going to share with you the proper actions that are needful in raising a godly family. When I said proper actions, I meant the things that God wants us to do. These are godly counsels as to our duties in bringing up a godly family. Firstly, we learn from Abraham that it's important that a man will exercise headship over the family. Now we do know we are living in a time when there is so much feministic, uh, feminism. A lot of um, talk about empowering women to the status of a man. Now it can never be done. It should never be done. It can never be done. Because God didn't create man and woman in, for that purpose. The Bible says even the creation order where man is created first and woman second is for the purpose that man will take lead and women would follow. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 7 and 11, Apostle Paul taught us that women are, to be sub always, uh, women are to be submissive to the husbands because woman is taken from man and not man from woman. This with reference to the creative order of things. Now Abraham was a man who exercised his headship of the family. Of course, there was one occasion or one or more, one or more occasions where he has failed. I know that. Like in the case when his wife Sarah suggested that he would take Hagar and have a child. He listened to her advice, which he shouldn't have done it because it was a sinful advice. When he listened to that advice, we know what happened. There were problems in the family. That peaceful family, all of a sudden, had jealousy, envy, and all the resultant problem. And he had to chase away Hagar with a very heavy heart. And so, Abraham had learned his lesson. But when we come to chapter 18, we see him in good shape in uh, exercising headship over his family in the best way. Now please turn your attention to the first eight verses and we are going to draw some lessons that God's word has for us. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lift up his eyes <coughs> and looked and lo there, sorry, <coughs> 
Three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the heart upon the earth. And Abraham <clears throat> ran unto the herd, and fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Firstly, we notice that Abraham was sitting in his tent or sat at the door of the tent in the heat of the day. One of the things that we notice about Abraham was that he was generally a tent dweller. I'm not saying he never got out of his tent, but he's seen almost all the time around his own family, with his family. Unlike Lot who is found as a city dweller who got involved in all the matters of the city and given less attention to his own family. I'm not saying it's wrong to live in a city. I'm not saying it is uh, wrong to be involved in the activities of the society which are needful and useful and godly. But I'm saying that when you become too involved in the society to the point of forgetting the need of guiding your own family, it is going to be very dangerous. It doesn't help in the nurture of godly family. One of the things that I have to remember all the time is this. As much as I would like to be a godly and effective pastor, I must also desire and work toward being a good husband and father at home. Because we know the principle in 1 Timothy 3, isn't it? If you cannot rule your own house well, how can you rule over the church? If you can't take care of the little household that God has given to you, how are you going to take a large household of God? It's not possible. But sometimes people try to be big time officers and professionals and businessmen and pastors by forgetting to attend to their own family. And I see in Abraham a great care for the family. He, he attended to the needs of the family because he knew he's the head of the family. He paid close attention to the way his house was managed, even though he had no children at this point of time. In a way, you know, one might say, oh, why would Abraham bother about the family so much? Anyway, he had no children of his own. Not too long ago, I met a gentleman uh, who could not have a child after about five years of marriage. Uh, it looks like his wife has some medical problems which prevented, from, prevented them from having a child. And he became bitter about it. He started to spend more time outside the house. He said, I have no joy when I come home. I always have to look at this wife and nothing else. And he became more and more, I'm talking about, about a Christian man, so-called Christian man. He became more and more agitated and frustrated with little issues that happen at home. And his reason 
My wife is so useless. I don't think that reflect the heart of a godly man. It's not his wife's uh, uh, wife's uh, problem in a sense that she did not deliberately avoid having a child. God's providence has worked it out that they shouldn't have any child at that point of time. God may give them a child sometime later or he may not give. But it is God who creates life and gives life. She is always praying for a child but just can't conceive. Here we have a situation where Sarah without a child. No, two or three or four or five years. Scores and scores of years have passed by. But Abraham remained tender toward her. It was Sarah who became restless and wanted to have a son. She said, oh, why don't you know, we do something? After all, God said he will give us a son and the son has not arrived and we are getting very old. As though she wanted to help God. <laughs> she suggested something that was so wicked. You know, my dear friends, when you are not mindful of your God-given place, even when things go against you, you can run into much trouble. Even when things go wrong, you must not use those difficulties as an excuse for abandoning your role in the family. What happens if the husband doesn't have job for one year? Does he have to give up the headship of the family? I, I met a man who said, you know, for the last five years I had no job. My wife is the one who brings home money, so I have no say anymore, she decides. What a sad thing. No. A husband is the head of the home. Who said so? God said so. And he must take the responsibility. He cannot be lazy. Of course there are situations where a husband cannot uh, fully function because of medical reasons. But even from a sick bed, he must, if he has life, act as the head of the family. Sometimes I ask young people who come for premarital counseling. What happens if your husband is bedridden for two years because of an accident or some sickness? Who will be the head of the family? They look at one another. And the wife, most of the time when I ask that question, the boys will keep quiet. The young men will keep quiet. Look at the girl. And she will look. Why are you looking at me? Of course you should be the husband. I mean, you should be the head. Well, that's right. But you can feel the tension. You know, the man will look at the girl and expect her to say, yes, you will be the head. I think you don't have to wait for her to say. You got to say, me! Because God made me the head of the home. Right or not? If the wife has any problem, you got to say, hey, I'm the head, okay? But what do you mean by being the head? Is not to be a bully at home. Is not to be a despot at home. But to behave like Abraham. Care for the family. Especially the spiritual care of the family. As, of course, you must not abandon providing for your family. If you don't provide for, me, for your family, you are an infidel. That's what Paul said. You got to provide for your family if God gives you good health. But look at the way he managed the house. When the visitors came, he, took, he went into the tent and told Sarah and the servants what to do. He directed the home even in the matter of hospitality. You know, when it comes to hospitality, I know this very well. Because often I like to have people coming to my home. In the church, from the church, <clears throat> it's very difficult. 
If the wife is not cooperative, it's very hard to be hospitable. True or not? If the wife will tell you, hey, don't bring anybody, I'm very tired. Finish. Hospitality is over. Right. But if the wife say, sure, what time are they coming? Oh, very easy. But sometimes when the ladies are not so happy, the man would slowly, slowly, as we say in Singapore, chicken out. Quietly, quietly withdraw from that honorable duty of being hospitable. If you want to be a leader of the church, if you are going to be an elder, one of the qualifications, you know what? Lovers of hospitality. You got to do that. So, how to be hospitable? It takes two people. One, the husband and the wife. Right? Husband must take lead. He got to tell the wives, look, our home will be a place for God's people to come. We cannot be selfish. When God gives us a house, well, we find rest in, that, in its comfort, but it is also for the comfort of others whom God would bring. And we must be mindful of that. So here, Abraham moves into the tent and tells him, do you realize this? He did not wait to consult Sarah to invite the people in. He decided first. After welcoming them, he goes in and tells the wife, please, sisters, will you be happy if your husbands do that? Feel like calling some names and ask. Let's say your husband come back from home and say, you know, <clears throat> This particular family in the, in the church is having a lot of trouble. I want to <clears throat> invite them and pray with them and give them some counsel. So I have made an appointment with, with them next, let's say Thursday night, they will be coming. What? Why you never asked me? <laughs> well, well, this is where the problem begins. Actually, hospitality is a good area where you can test how the family is functioning. And you better learn this. When the, husband's, when the husband came home and told Sarah that we have visitors, let's prepare a meal for them. Well, she cooperated immediately. His wife was submissive to him and cooperated with him. But when you come to chapter 19, by the way, we won't go into it, but you can check on your own uh, later. When the angels went to Sodom, Lot invited them to home. You know who prepared the food? According to chapter 19, Lot himself prepared the food. The wife didn't cooperate. It's a clear sign that she was lost by then. She's already gone. Very clearly the scripture says he prepared the food for him. Here Sarah was a submissive woman, cooperated with him. And she was more than willing to submit herself to the commands of her husband in managing the household chores. Do you know dear friends, husband is the head and the wife is the manager of the house. Today, maids are the managers. And when the wife comes home and the maid didn't do the things that she said, she go berserk, scratch the maid, poke her with fork and spoon, pull her hair and end up in jail. Right? We see a lot of such stories today. Because the ladies are not managing the house. They want the house to be in a certain order, a certain way things ought to be prepared, a certain way children must be attended to. But the maids couldn't be bothered. They are like hirelings. You know, they are hired servants. They don't feel a motherly care for the children. They don't feel a wifely responsibility at home. Please don't think your, wife, your maids will completely replace you. Yes, maids are useful. They are needful from time to time. I'm not speaking bad about maids. We thank God for all godly maids who are responsible. Nonetheless, no maid ever replaces the lady at home. 
A mother is an irreplaceable person in the life of a family. And she's a manager. Many of us got it wrong and we were out of the home working all the time. Our children grew up without much motherly affection. You know, after a long day's work, when you come home and spend two hours in the night with your children, you can't give them the real motherly love, no matter how much you care and want to. I see many sisters' frustration. They work so hard in this cruel world but everybody is running for money, money, money. Poor ladies become like a donkey for them to ride on. And when they come home, they've got a husband to care for. They've got children to care for. They've got to prepare for the next day to work. And they become a bundle of nerves. They can't keep their hearts clean and clear. Minds go haywire. Bible expects sisters to be joyful mothers at home. But today we have mournful and woeful mothers at home. What a tragedy. And I blame the men in the family for that. Because many husbands would say to the wives, Oh, not enough. You better go and make more money. You better bring more money so we can drive a car, so we can upgrade. And they, do they realize what they're doing to their wives whom they say they love? You should be tender with your wives. You should be gentle with them and let them have a peaceful atmosphere at home. Don't look at the women that God has given to you as a means for survival. They're not the breadwinners. Of course, extraordinary circumstances. They probably have to go out and work when the man cannot work. But in normal circumstances, every man must rise up and say, I will take the responsibility. I will work by the sweat of my brow. I will bring food home. And that's enough. I will help you to manage it. I will not be unreasonable in demanding things. That's why Paul says in Titus chapter 2, women ought to be keepers at home. But most of the time what I see is that men exercise their headship wrongly, chase the woman out for bringing more money. <clears throat> Today we are living in a world that tells us trials and difficulties in life is not a good thing. <coughs> we must be living in material comfort all the time. <clears throat> and this is particularly a problem in our society in Singapore. We are a very money-driven society. Well, dear friends, every man must pay attention to make his family life a pleasant experience. I must make my home a pleasant place. I must help my wife to make my home a pleasant place. You know, when I come home, sometimes a bit late because of prayer meeting or counseling or Bible study or this and that, I see my wife very tired and I feel very troubled. It happened long ago when my second son was born. I came home pretty late and I saw my wife at the kitchen washing plates, almost 10.30 p.m. I put down my bag, I went straight to the kitchen and put my arms around her and said, darling, I love you, I'm sorry I'm late, are you okay? She looked at me and said, you love me? I said, yes. Then can you do something? Please take the broom and sweep the floor, otherwise I won't be able to sleep until 12 midnight. Because I have to wash all these cups and the children's toys are all over the place. And I got to get ready their, their milk for the night. And you have to go tomorrow morning early. I say, oh I'm sorry. So love is no more saying sweet words. It's not putting arms around the wife. It's not reading a poem to her. It's trying to make it a pleasant experience for her at home. If you carefully read what Abraham did, he went about looking into the needs in the family. He didn't stand there and say, Sarah, there are two, three visitors here. Can you prepare everything? Mm. No, he went into the tent and he looked at the things that they had. 
He got the servants to do their part. And then he came out with the food. And he served the food. Now some husbands try to be head of the family by sitting on the rocking chair watching TV. Bring me a tea please. Bring my book here. Bring my Bible here. No wonder our belly becomes bigger and bigger, right? <laughs> like mine. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying this to make you laugh. But these are the very sickly things that creep into our homes and destroy it. So, exercise your headship in a loving way. And make sure that your leadership is giving your home a pleasant atmosphere. Not only for your own wife and your maids and manservants, but also for visitors whom God would send. In this visitation, of course, two of them were angels and one was the Lord himself. Again, dear friends, we must now move further and take note that he was actually a man not only cared for uh, Sarah and helped her to make the home a better place, but he, according to the word of God in verses 19 and 20 of this chapter, was a man who has prepared his heart to command his children. Let's look at this. Isaac is not born at, and at God says in verse 19, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. You see, the Lord said before he gave the son that he promised to Abraham, that I know Abraham will guide his children. Now, young men who are married or going to get married who do not have children yet, right? Now listen, don't say uh, no children so I couldn't be bothered about what I would do when the children come. When the children come, I just do what I want. No. I say to those who are not married but coming close to the marriageable age, even if you are a teenager, you can start thinking about this. Lord, make me a man who will lead my home in the future the way you want me to be. Don't wait until marriage happens or children arrive. You must now prepare yourself to be the best husband and the best father. What am I supposed to do? God, God here says about Abraham that by the time I shall arrive, he will be all ready to command his children in the way of the Lord. You know, there are some who think that we can let the children do what they want. Let them make mistakes. Let them learn from their mistakes. I don't have to always tell them, do this or don't do that. Some believe in letting children make their own decision and learn through mistakes. But let me tell you, if you do that, you may find yourself struggling because it would have been, it, it might have a case where things have gone too far, too late, that you can do nothing about it. It's better to prevent your children from getting into sin than trying to correct it after they commit sin. Of course, as we say, prevention is better than cure. You must take charge of your children's life. Especially when they are young, when they can be trained. Train up a child the way it should go. And you shall not depart from it. Now that is God's promise. And the God's promise is given to us if we obey that. Train up the child the way it should go. Well, you might then suddenly ask, then how about election? If God hasn't elected my child, it may not walk the way of the Lord. Now, you don't worry about election. God has done that. Your duty is to carry out your responsibility that God gave. 
I know I have only one duty. It is not about to worry about election. But my duty as a spiritual father to my children is to preach the gospel to them and let them know the glory, glorious grace that is in Christ and the glorious truth that Christ has given. Urge them day after day to walk with the Lord. <clears throat> my first son has gone into national service two days ago. First night he called back and talked to me and talked to the mother. And somehow he remembered that I didn't, got, didn't get my visa, so I'll be at home. Last night he called me at 10.30. And when I heard his voice, I was quite excited. Today, I said, nobody's at home, I'm alone. So I don't have to share the phone with anybody. You talk to me, okay? I'm the only one here. Mommy and children are all in the retreat. Okay, Daddy, it's all right. So how are things? Oh, that is terrible. So what is so terrible? Is it the physical exercise? No, today I had nothing to do. It was raining. We just sit there and some office work. Now and then that's all. Then what is so terrible? Daddy, I never heard so much vulgarities before in my life. <coughs> vulgarities, vulgarities. Oh, that is terrible. I said, son, this is what the world is. All this time you were under the protection of a godly home. Now you are 24 hours, seven days a week in the world. You have been prepared for this. This is the time you should show what you have learned. Well, I'm glad your heart is waxed about it because you don't agree with it. Now never, never desire the prosperity of this world. This is what we get. And I prayed with him. And I thank God I could pray with him last night over the phone. Long ago I decided in my heart many things about my children and how I want to guide them. And I'm still committed to it. It's not about material things. I always told my children, children, I look forward to the day when three of you would stand up and serve the Lord and I can die with seeing all the three of you that God has given to me serving the Lord in the mission fields or some way as the Lord directs you. I'm not do looking forward to you becoming a, a doctor or, or something. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to be a doctor. Well, we need doctors as well, isn't it? We need all sorts of professional people. but. My desire, because the Lord gave me that burden, and I want them to serve the Lord, but they are not called it. I can't send them to pastors, to be pastors and missionaries without God calling them. And my prayer is that. Now my son just finished his A-levels. He had to choose what subject uh, to be signed on in the NUS. <clears throat> he was a science student, so naturally you expect him to take a science subject. But I was praying in my heart, Lord, would these things help him to be a preacher next time? Guide his heart. Lord, please. Please. The day before he entered the national service, he had to uh, put down what subject he wanted to choose. And he said, Daddy, what do you think? I said, what are your choices? Oh, well, a couple of them. What? Pharmacy? Science, food science, bio, bioengineering, a few things he mentioned. I said, well, he said, what? Uh, you really want? No other choice, Daddy. I don't know. I don't like all these things. I, I want something that will help me next time to serve God. I said, oh, you start to think about it? Well, yeah. Then I said, how about some completely different subject? Maybe something that will help you next time to write well and to think well and to express yourself well. How about English? Good, that's it. So now you sign up for English course. I was a bit sheepish. Should I exercise my authority? Now if I tell him something, Daddy said, take English. 
he may hate me for the rest of his life. How to put it across? I've been praying and praying. The mother was sitting with him and talking about all the possible subject combinations, going through the prospectus, reading from page to page, cover to cover. You know, I couldn't be bothered. I said, Lord, please guide, guide his heart. I don't know what. Only your will, only your will, please, Lord. And then one day I was sitting there and he came the last hour before the opportunity goes away from him to sign up because he's going to national service. And there he comes. God arranged all. My prayer was answered in that. Well, I wish he would go straight to FEBC, Forest and Bible College, after his national service. Well, let God decide on that, the timing. But dear friends, you know, you can't be clueless as to what you want to do with your children's life. In Psalm 127, we are told, children like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. You know what is arrows in the mighty man's hand is all about? It's not to shoot anywhere you like, shoot, shoot, shoot. No. When, when you put the arrow on the bow, you aim it and stretch and let go. And it goes with maximum speed to the target. Chum, stays there. So are the children of the youth. How can we be clueless as to bringing up our children? Shouldn't we have some desire and prayer in the will of God? But we have followed the world that couldn't be bothered or sell our children to the passions of the world. It's okay to be doctors, but let, and let's encourage them to be godly doctors. It's okay for them to be teachers or police officers or commanders or whatever God would let them be. But they have to be told all these decisions have to be made after seeking God, not after your own lust or the wishes and whim of people around you. It has to be God's will. You must pray for the protection of your family. After <clears throat> having said this, that we must exercise headship, I must always remind the fathers that, look, it is a duty that we cannot carry out on our own without trusting in God. It's a burden that is too big for us to bear. Every father and mother would confess that, isn't it? It's so hard to bring up our children in this terrible world. You know, there are many instances in the Bible where Abraham prayed to the Lord. He communed with the Lord. He was happy to listen to God. He trusted in God for a child. It is by faith they received Isaac and brought him up. The Bible has many, many evidences to that. But then his prayer life has gone beyond the immediate circle of his family. He even prayed for his nephew and his family. Remember the intercession he had? From 50 down to 10. Lord, if there will be 50 righteous, will you destroy that city? Finally, he came to number 10. Lord, if, if there will be 10, would you destroy that city? What was the answer? No. But he asked no more. You know why? Lord's family had about 10 people. You know the two, two daughters who ran away with him? And his wife who became a pillar of salt? That's four, isn't it? Then we are told of sons-in-laws. That's in plural. That means there were two other daughters, at least two other daughters, married with sons-in-laws of the Lord. So that makes it four. So four plus four, eight. And there is also a mention of sons. How many of you do not know? Let's say there are two sons. That makes it ten. So Abraham concluded that of Lot's family, there are now less than 10. 
There's nothing more to ask. He said, my prayer must stop here. Because if I cannot pray for that which is against God's will, God cannot be accused for justly punishing a city where there is not one family that is holy. God must be glorified through his wrath and judgment. He stopped praying. You know, some of us <clears throat> unjustly pray for our children whom we have long given up to the world. We have not bothered to guide their hearts in godly ways. We did not rebuke them when they were wrong, when they were reading the wrong books, when they were watching the wrong movies, when they were engaging with wrong friendships. We never stopped them. We actually encouraged them. By our silence, we encourage them, giving consent to their ungodliness. And then when they go wrong, we pray, Lord, protect them. No, too late. Prayers must be offered from the very beginning as you exercise your responsibility. Not when everything has gone wrong, you start praying. God may deliver you. But if you are a person like Lot, who has known God's mind all the time and abandoned your duty, well, <clears throat> prayer is not a solution. Prayer is not to get God to do things against His own will and purposes. Prayer is, first of all, yielding ourselves to do God's will. <clears throat> How prayerful are you? for your children, about the spiritual life. Thirdly, be separate from the ungodly society around you. Now, we have said this in a different way when we talk about Lot, but let me also bring this to attention. Separation from worldliness is necessary to be in the blessings of God, which is infinitely superior to all that the world offers. You know, sometimes we find it so hard to separate ourselves from the way of the world because we think we will lose a lot of things if we become so full of sanctification, separation from sin. You know, sometimes in this world, people say, well, a little bit of sin, okay. You can't help it. World is like that. These are the things we say. But look at Abraham. He was comfortably living in the land of the Chaldees. It's known as the Ur of the Chaldees. But God said, get thee out of this country to a land that I will show you. He, he had to separate immediately from all his relatives. Leave the idol-worshipping people where he was born and went to a land that he has never seen because God said, separate yourself and follow me. You see, if one has to f bring his family to God and bring them up in the nurture of godliness, he has to, first of all, follow the Lord. To follow the Lord, he had to separate from the sins and the world that is contrary to God's will. So God said to Abraham, come out. You read that in Genesis 12. Again, as I said a while ago in my previous message, when he made a mistake and went down to Egypt to escape the famine, there God has dealt with him. He almost lost his wife. Remember that? He even told a lie about his wife Sarah that she is my sister. He wanted to hide the fact that she is his wife so that he can save his skin. But then God intervened. God spoke through Pharaoh and asked him to leave quickly. That's recorded for us in the following chapter. And now, so we, when we realize the separation that God has required from Abraham time after time we realize that there's no way 
we can guide our children if we get entangled with the world. When he was in Egypt, there was little chance for him to exercise his headship and guide his family in the worship of God. You know, when you look at chapter 13 of Genesis, you may want to take a quick look at it. Genesis 13 verses 1 to 4. You see, Abraham returned from Egypt into the land that the Lord gave, the promised land. And the Bible here says wonderfully in verse 2, And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. He worshipped the Lord there. You see, my dear friends, it was famine which took him to Egypt. He thought in Egypt he can be prospered. But God said, no, this is not the place that I want you to be. Get back. Take your wife, which you, which you almost lost. Now take her because I've given you her back. Take your wife and go back. And when he reached the place where God appointed him to be, he started to prosper quickly. You see, my dear friends, God can sometimes remove your financial capabilities or your health for a time. That is not for you to say, now I can go where I want. No, it is to wait upon Him. Only when you wait upon the Lord and worship Him, then God will prosper you for His glory. Again, the Lord taught Abraham, you must separate yourself from the ungodly world around you. You can't just choose to go in and out as you like. By the way, at this point of time, I must assure you something. The separation that the Bible teaches us is not some sort of isolation from people. Now, let me explain this. When we separate from worldly men and the system, we draw closer to people who are dedicated to the cause of the Lord. Right? We may pull away from ungodly people, but then we become closer to godly people. And that's what Abraham did. Abraham was not a loner. He had a large household of servants and maids and herdsmen. And he guided them in the way of the Lord. <clears throat> in those days, the master of the house <clears throat> would normally require the people in his household to follow his faith. And it was common. And so was in Abraham's case. <clears throat> and he was also involved in training a highly skillful army of 318 men. Now imagine this. He is in this promised land, away from the hustle and bustle of Sodom, away from Egypt. He is there in the appointed place, separated from all his ancestors and relatives in in Ur of Chaldees and there he is having a big community of people people who are attached to him who want to stand by his faith who wants to believe in the promise that God has given to Abraham he said welcome and he nurtures them in fact these 318 men were valiant men they were fighters they were well skilled they are, I would say, really a bunch of dedicated, enthusiastic, and enterprising people. Abraham trained them, fed them, looked after them. Abraham was in charge of these people. And these people, by no means, were a weak society. Certainly, <clears throat> They did not have the pleasure and pomp of Sodom. They probably lacked the facilities and earthly advantages of a well-organized city like Sodom. Because they were away from all those well-developed cities. They were in this vast wilderness area. But that's where God brought them. God told them this is a land there is... There were, there, uh, land which can produce milk and honey. So they are there to be an enterprising people. 
They are there to occupy it, cultivate it, organize it. But not like the way of the world, but as God wants it to be. So Abraham to be a very, very interested person in the things of God. He doesn't want to think about the way of the world. He wants to think for God, through the will of God, and see what he has to do. You know, we people must be like that. When God says separate yourself from the world, we shouldn't feel bad about it. We must think, okay, if I'm supposed to separate from all these worldly systems, which are contrary to God, then what am I supposed to do? Well, God has taught us what to do in the Word. We must fellowship with God's saints. We must be active in mutually edifying. We must do everything that will honor God. There are so many things we can do. You know, sometimes as a pastor I think, what a waste. We got hundreds of people in the church. Oh, we got 300 of people in our church. Many of them are wasting their time in the world. If all these people were to come together and give the very best according to God's will, whoa, what great things we can achieve. But few men think that way. <coughs> you know, my dear friends, watch this. When the real test came, it was Abraham and his godly men who succeeded. When Sodom was attacked by Kedar Laomer and his friends, Sodom couldn't protect Lot. Lot and his family were taken as captives. But look, who went to rescue them? Abraham and his men, who found their strength in the presence of God. They were not familiar with the com com complex political and city life. They were away from the urban uh, sophistication. They didn't understand, probably they never got involved in the political wrangling that were going on in the Sodom area. They were away. They were not interested in those things. They were more interested about what God wants them to do in the promised land. And they were together, one united people for God. They just cut themselves off of all the things of the world and remain focused, enterprising, training themselves according to God's will. But when a test came, the rest failed. They were the best. Imagine the rescue operation done by Abraham and his men. 380 men with Abraham. Chasing after this victorious group of kings. Going away with their loots from Sodom. Here comes the commandos in the name of God. Utterly defeats the alliance of the kings that took over Sodom and rescues Sodom. I think the way they have carried out this operation would make even the modern Israeli commandos proud. Tremendous. But how did they manage? By separating themselves from the world and being active with the people whom God gave in the things of God. You know, I don't need a thousand strong congregation to do great things for God. All that I need to do is to separate myself from everything that damages my life and cleave to a group of men and women who have dedicated themselves to the Lord. That's all I need. And that's where I want my son to grow up. That's where my... My daughter should grow up. If every one of you were to think like that, can you imagine what we can do? We will be more than conquerors through Christ who strengthened us. This is how we should build up our family. This is how we must be a godly community. Not by, li li not by being like Lot, going after the worldliness and say, never mind, it's okay. Every, you know, if you have to live and thrive in this world, you've got to be compromising, you know. God understands. What did you say? What did you say? God understands? What? That you have to compromise with sin? <laughs> Please don't blaspheme. Please don't blaspheme. God doesn't need the help of Sodom. Remember what Abraham said to the king of Sodom? I don't need your money, you'd keep it. I don't want you ever to say that God's servant was supported by you. No, I don't need that. 
Keep it in your pocket. My wealth is my God. My strength is my God. The way of my life and my families is the way of the Lord. And I will separate myself from the things of the world and stick with God. And I shall be valiant with my Lord. With Him, I shall do valiantly. How many of you will rise up and say that? How many of you will be willing to deliberately, deliberately and systematically pull yourself away from things that would corrupt us? <clears throat> May God give us grace to do just that. Now, dear friends, let me conclude by saying just a word. If you would be like Abraham, to separate yourself from the world, so that you can do that which God wants you to do with prayer, your family will be blessed. Because the Lord will be your deliverer. The Lord will be the builder of your house, not others. Now, please come to chapter 14. I want to show you this. <clears throat> You know, if you were to look into verse 18, after the battle, Abraham was returning and he was met by another king called Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem. He was a godly man, according to the verse in 18. And here, Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness, king of Salem, which is actually Jerusalem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God and he blessed him. Alright? It looks like God has fetched him. He was a prefigure of Christ. Now, what did he say in verse 19? Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Even Melchizedek, who was watching Abraham, said, Abraham, I know why you are so triumphant. I know the secret of your success. It's not the military skill and prowess of the kings that fought in the battle. It is the presence of your God. The promise of your God. You know, my dear friends, when you separate yourself from the world, as God wants you to do, then God will come to your aid and everyone around you will see it. This man is blessed of God. This man has done valiantly because he cleaved to the Lord. He took his promises. Our children may have to let go some of the glamours of this world. I know how difficult it is. Sometimes I have to tell my children, you know, you can't join that, please stop it. I remember when one of my children was singing in the school choir, they had some sort of musical going on. It was utterly worldly. And I told my son, please stay away from it. Daddy, I'm the choir president, what am I supposed to do? I said, this is the time for you to prove whether you prefer to be a president of the choir or to be a godly child. Be like Daniel who said, I will not defile my heart with king's wine and mead. Show it if you are a Christian. He went back to the choir master and said, Sorry, I can't be part of it because my Christian conviction won't allow it. Hey, Cornelius, what are you talking about? This is a mission school, you know. I'm also a Christian, you know. I'm a church choir master, you know. If I can conduct this, why you can't? He said, well, this is utterly ungodly. You know the lyrics, you know the background of the song. And he took a stand, he didn't participate in it. Yes, he came back and said, Daddy is so, so difficult. Everybody is looking down on me. Say, it's okay, son, that's all right. But God is looking at you. That's your strength. We don't want the glory that comes with worldliness. We want the strength from the Lord to fight against the world in us. That's what we want. 
Now I hope my children and all the young people who are listening to me here will find the strength with the Lord. The glamour and the gain and the prosperity that comes with the world is not worthwhile. Later on in Genesis 24, he applied this separation principle further. When Abraham wanted to see that his son, who is of marriageable age, way past marriageable age, almost 40 years old, had to choose a wife, he called his servant and said, don't take any daughters of the Canaanites around us. Go and find from my own background. Well, I believe it was the faith that caused him to say that. A desire to separate himself from the Canaanite world that was so badly corrupted with idolatry and all other wickedness of idolatrous worship. He said to his son that you must choose one that God gives to you. Well, I'm not saying it has to be arranged marriage all the time. It can be a love marriage, as we say, your own choice, or somebody introduce someone to you, or your parents would prefer you to con consider someone. Whatever it be, whatever means God might use to bring a spouse to you, apply the principle of separation. That means it should never be one who is not of God's will. Even in that, Abraham took leadership and exercised the doctrine of separation. And I believe that. And I don't tell my children, they are still pretty young to talk about marriage, but I often tell them, watch your friends. Never fall in love with anyone who is not godly. Keep close to the Lord. Now that's the kind of Abrahamic faith that we should follow. Remember, at the beginning of this evening's meeting, we sang, God of Abraham, praise. How to praise the God of Abraham? By living like Abraham in following God and dedicating yourself to be a father, a husband, the command the household after God. Calling each one in the family to separate himself or herself from the world and yield to the purposes and will of God so that together, under your leadership, they might grow in the Lord. That's the kind of families that we need today. Let me challenge all the young men and even gentlemen who are here. Are you taking that kind of leadership? If you have not, do it now. Don't leave it to your wives. It's your duty because you are the head of the family. And sisters, pray for your husbands. Pray for the father of your children. Children, pray for your parents. That they will teach the word. They will say, let's separate. Because the word of God doesn't allow us to join in this. Follow that. Don't challenge such biblical leadership. May God give us the kind of leadership that Abraham gave to the family. And may each of us be biblical thoroughly for the glory of God.